Great, thank you again, Jennifer. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about rare ovarian cancers and uh, tell you that every challenge represents a great opportunity. Um, I think one of the most important uh, features of this is that not all uh, uh, ovarian cancers are created equal. And so one size certainly does not uh, fit all women who have ovarian cancer. This is a modified uh, World Health Organization classification of ovarian tumors. It doesn't include all of them, but it includes many of the important rare ovarian cancers. And so what you see is that some of these are rare, others are very rare, and yet others are exceedingly rare. So rare ones would, would include clear cell, low-grade serous, mucinous and endometroid, some of the germ cell tumors, particularly yolk sac tumor and dysgerminoma, and granulosa cell tumor, which is a sex cord stromal tumor. Very rare uh, ovarian uh, tumors would include carcinosarcoma, things like small cell carcinoma, hypercalcemic type, choriocarcinoma, and Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. And then we, we have exceedingly rare tumors such as seromucinous carcinoma, Wolfian tumor, polyembryoma, and a steroid cell tumor. So very different in terms of their uh, commonality. Um, we know that rare ovarian cancers differ tremendously. Each one is unique. And so they differ in uh, their incidence and their prevalence. So more indolent or slow growing tumors may have a higher prevalence than more aggressive tumors. Each one of them has a very characteristic histology or microscopic appearance. Uh, the molecular profile is different for each one of these, the state, as is the stage distribution. So for instance, mucinous carcinoma and granulosa cell tumor typically present in, in the early stages, whereas something like low-grade serous carcinoma presents usually in uh, the advanced stage. And the clinical behavior and prognosis for each one of these tumors is very different, uh, and that uh, translates into much different treatments for many of these rare types. So these are the rare epithelial ovarian cancers. Uh, Jennifer mentioned high-grade serous, which is the most common and not considered rare. It's really the reference subtype. But the, uh, but the rare types are low-grade serous, endometroid, mucinous, and clear cell. And you can see what their uh, frequencies are here as well. I mentioned that they differ tremendously in terms of their molecular biology. So you can again see for the for high-grade serous, the most common versus the rare epithelial ovarian subtypes, that P53 and the BRCA gene are common, are re relatively common in uh, high-grade serous, but low-grade serous typically has either KRAS, BRAF, or NRAS mutations, Clear cell and endometrioid frequently have ARID1A or PIK3CA mutations, and mucinous carcinomas may have a KRAS mutation or amplification of HER2 nu or HERB2. Uh, these are um, from the NCCN or National Comprehensive Cancer Network website. This is uh, available to uh, everybody. Uh, both the public, uh, lay, lay public, as well as um, professionals. And this just gives you some example of some of the standard algorithms for rare ovarian cancers. So this is carcinosarcoma, clear cell carcinoma, mucinous carcinoma of the ovary, uh, grade one endometroid carcinoma, low-grade serous carcinoma, and then malignant sex cord stromal tumors, such as granulosa cell tumor and malignant germ cell tumors. So just to give you a few examples. But of course, it doesn't include every rare ovarian cancer. Um, this is a slide that shows you that different histologies or different subtypes of uh, ovarian cancer uh, respond differently to different modalities of treatment. So for chemotherapy, we know that high-grade serous carcinoma is relatively sensitive. 
We also know that germ cell tumors in general are exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy. Small cell uh, hypercalcemic type is somewhat sensitive to chemotherapy. For endocrine therapy, low-grade serous carcinoma, endometroid carcinomas, and also granulosa cell tumors may be sensitive to endocrine or hormonal therapies. Most all of these tumors have some sensitivity to the anti-angiogenic drugs, such as bevacizumab or Evastin, and, and many of them may be uh, amenable to treatment with targeted therapies. So PARP inhibitors, as was mentioned, for high-grade serous, but for the rare types, low-grade serous, the MEK inhibitors, BRAF inhibitors, for clear, clear cell and endometroid, the PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR, uh, and ARID1A inhibitors, for mucinous, again, possibly MEK or BRAF inhibitors, and ERB2 inhibitors, and so on. So, uh, and then finally, immunotherapy, um, as the results from many clinical trials have been disappointing, but we know that particularly clear cell carcinoma uh, and also maybe small cell hypercalcemic type uh, are relatively sensitive to immunotherapy, whereas some of the other types either have not been studied or have been found not to be so sensitive to the current uh, drugs. Uh, this just shows you the level of expertise for rare ovarian tumors from a general practitioner uh, to specialist to subspecialist to an expert. And I consider an expert to be a subset, generally, of either gynecologic oncologists or medical oncologists who treat patients with these rare ovarian cancers. So if you're looking for a second opinion or consultation uh, uh, to, to obtain expertise, you really want to search for that subset of uh, physicians who, who specialize or subspecialize in that area. These are some of the keys to the optimal outcomes for women with rare ovarian tumors. So uh, for women who are newly diagnosed, certainly seeking out a gynecologic oncologist at a high volume center for primary surgery is really key in terms of comprehensive surgical staging for early disease and maximal cytoreduction reduction for women who have advanced stage disease. And then very importantly, there are many young women who have early stage disease who may be candidates for, for fertility sparing surgery. Uh, it's important also to note that uh, the pathology of rare ovarian tumors can be quite difficult to diagnose and um, and so referral to a gynecologic pathologist who is, has expertise in a particular type is really key. And then seeking uh, second opinions from experts at the time of either primary diagnosis, as I mentioned, or particularly relapse to know what are the treatment options, what are the clinical trials and uh, potentially available for, for your uh, subtype is really important. And then finally, uh, these are some of the challenges and barriers when we talk about rare ovarian cancers in terms of small numbers of cases, which impact the feasibility and design of clinical trials, long accrual times on clinical trials because these are uncommon uh, tumors. There, there can be few inv uh, interested investigators, uh, much less attention by the scientific community, which also translates, it, translates into low funding priority from both federal agencies, foundations, and industry. Um, there are generally fewer uh, patient advocates and a lack of standard bioinformatics that help us design clinical trials. So in, in uh, closing, I would say that uh, these are some of the opportunities for progress uh, in rare ovarian cancers. Investigators partnering with strong patient advocacy groups engaging uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, other agencies uh, uh, to a much greater degree than has been done in the past, continuing to mine the molecular biology of rare ovarian cancers because we really, I think, just scratched the surface in understanding um, the biology of these tumors, developing uh, an innovative clinical trials, which has occurred for some rare cancers, not others, 
and then establishing registries and biorepositories for these rare ovarian cancers. And many times that can emanate from the establishment of national uh, networks or consortium. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I, I look forward to hearing the other speakers and uh, addressing some of the questions. Thank you.